Welcome everyone to our first Friday's Lunch and Learn uh, for the month of December. Happy holidays to everybody. I'm, I'm trying to be decked out in red and Santa spirit uh, to you know, close out this crazy tumultuous year. Ken uh, graduated from ICS in 2015. Uh, some of you might have met him at homecoming. He was helping out at the booth. So he's been very involved since we started this year. And he is the starter and found, uh, he does OC Android, a local Android developer group. So he has some really great insights into this mobile field. Um, before I pass it off to him, uh, please check out our website, icsanteaters.org. And on that website, you will find links to all our social media and our emails and things like that. So please follow, like, share, subscribe. We want to get our user uh, subscriptions up. So please pass the words al word along. Uh, upcoming events, we will have some interesting game nights and scavenger hunts in 2021. So just look out for those emails and notifications on social media. Our first Friday for January actually will be probably the second Friday. We will send out emails and notifications. The topic will be innovation and the new you in the new year. So it'll be actually a pretty fun, exciting topic to um, look forward for 2021. February will be Black History Month and March is Women's History Month. So we'll have a cool panel style event. And I think that'll be a great way to have different members of the community partake. Um, so really looking forward to that. If you have anybody that would be interested in being in that panel, please send us an email. So without further ado, let's get Ken to tell him about himself. So Ken, go ahead. Hey, everyone. Your screen and everything. Let me take over the screen share. Can you guys see my slide deck? Yep. Awesome, sure, cool. So as Pooja said, I'm Ken, I graduated in 2015. Um, I run OC Android along with Vladimir, who I think is somewhere on this call as well. And then I'm an Android developer at Acorn. So obviously I have a well-documented Android bias, but um, I did my best to keep this kind of just generic as possible in terms of mobile, because I think all the trends that are gonna affect Android um, will be there for iOS as well. So let's jump into it. Um, just a quick outline of what I'll talk about. I'll give some Android and iOS statistics, talk about cross-platform development, uh, instant apps and app clips, biometrics, AR, VR, as well as IoT and wearables. Um, the first three are kind of the main topics and then the last three are kind of what I'll touch on a bit if there's time allowed it. So let's jump into Android and iOS. So just a quick background, Android was founded in October of 2003 as Android Inc. And it was originally intended to be an OS for digital cameras. Um, they were acquired by Google in July of 05. And then they launched publicly their first mobile OS version in September of 08. And their latest Android right now is Android 11, which launched in September of this year. And native apps are written in Kotlin and Java. Um, iOS, on the other hand, it's owned by Apple and was internally developed by then, them beginning in 05. And they launched um, a year prior to Android in 07. Their latest is iOS 14, which also came out in September. And their native apps are written in Swift and Objective-C. So that's just some quick brief background. Now let's jump into some kind of charts and numbers on what the comparisons look like between the two. So we have the US market share uh, chart right here. And so this is spanning data from 09 to 2020. Um, so we see here in 09, iOS had basically a runaway lead from anywhere else, close to around 60% of the market share. Um, the next closest at that point was BlackBerry down here. Um, BlackBerry obviously quickly declined. Um, Windows Phone and Symbian OS never really picked up in the US. And Android kind of had a steady climb, um, getting close to iOS in a couple of years in uh, 2011 and 2015. Um, but there's still kind of a commanding lead in terms of market share um, benefiting iOS. The global market, on the other hand, is a completely different story. Um, this chart looks very different. 
Um, as we can see, Android has roughly 70% market share worldwide at this point. Um, Symbian OS, which ran on some Nokia PDAs, uh, used to have a big market share overseas that obviously dropped off. Um, BlackBerry dropped off as well. Windows never picked up any steam. And then iOS has kind of been holding steady in this range between 16% and 32% um, for kind of most of the years globally. Um, so while iOS has a commanding lead in the US market share, um, globally it's always Android. And those are important things to keep in mind if you're going to be building a mobile app. Um, because which version you focus on, if you're only going to focus on Android or iOS, should really be dictated by whether your app is purely a US app or if your app is meant for kind of a global marketplace. And then uh, speaking of more statistics, if we look at the distribution of free versus paid apps in the Google Play Store um, for the last few quarters from uh, June 2019 to September 20, as we can see, um, there's been a slight decrease in the amount of paid apps being uh, utilized, um, but really a drop off from 4.4% to 3.5% isn't that huge of a drop off in the grand scheme of things. Um, you're gonna, it's a very small percentage uh, regardless. Um, so free apps are still king, at least in Google and uh, Statistics are a little bit better for paid apps on iOS, but they're very similar. Um, here, the drop off is 10% to 7.7% from June 19 to September 20. Um, those are still very small percentages, which is why you'll find most of the popular apps in the app stores are not a product in it of themselves, but they are more of a distribution platform for a product. And by that, I mean, um, Say for example, the Netflix app. The Netflix app isn't the product itself. The Netflix service is the product. The Netflix app is just a way to access said Netflix service, um, which is kind of how the majority of apps on the app store are going to make their money is um, they're kind of a means of accessing something else. Um, most of the, I don't have any statistics in here about it, but most of the uh, money coming in for paying for the actual app comes in the game sphere. Um, so those are just some interesting things to kind of consider. Um, in terms of cross-platform development, um, I always get asked about this a lot. Anytime um, people are thinking about starting an app, they want to like know, you know, is it easy to do cross-platform? Will it work? Um, and so what is it, first of all, I guess I should start with. And so the idea is it's a shared code base across Android and iOS. So if you're building native Android and native iOS apps, there is no shared code between the two. Um, but if you're gonna use a cross-platform solution that gives you the ability to share parts or all of your code from one platform with the other. And so there's both some pros and cons to doing cross-platform. Um, one of the pros is obviously reduce development time and cost because instead of building two completely unique code bases, you're building one code base that's shared across the board and gets you into two ecosystems, the App Store and the Google Play Store. Um, it also enforces consistency across platforms. Um, one of the things we constantly see, like at work, for example, um, on the native apps I work on at Acorns, um, we always have some minor inconsistencies across platforms. So maybe iOS built this screen this way and then Android built it this way, but Android's using like a slightly different font or a different color. Um, so there's always, when you're doing cross-platform, you kind of avoid a lot of those since your code is powering two systems. It's a lot easier to kind of make sure with a little oversight that both systems look the same. And it can also just reduce barriers in terms of language expertise, which I think is one of the main reasons I hear a lot of people that go into cross-platform uh, do it for is because they're like, oh, I, I'm usually building web apps, I know JavaScript, and 
I want to be able to apply my JavaScript knowledge to build an Android or an iOS app. And so because cross-platform frameworks come in a lot of different languages, you kind of break down some of those barriers of needing to know Kotlin or needing to know Swift that come with building the native apps. Uh, there are some cons though. Um, it's a lot more difficult to build complex UIs with cross-platform tools um, because because the tools are trying to do something that the systems aren't really built for, there come to be some difficulties with some of this stuff. Um, and each framework kind of approaches in different ways. Um, for example, I believe React Native tries to use the native, break everything down that you build in the UI down to the native UI views in iOS and Kotlin behind the scenes, where something like Flutter um, doesn't use native views at all behind the scenes. And it just um, opens up a big canvas and it draws everything on that canvas itself. Um, and so depending on which framework you get, um, it might be very obvious to the user that you're using a cross-platform framework in your app. Um, I know myself as an Android developer, when I open up an app on my phone, I can very clearly tell when some of certain frameworks are used because certain frameworks give off a very kind of janky feeling in a way. Um, they just don't kind of behave as smooth some of the animations as they do when the apps are written natively. And this also plays in the fact that some of these frameworks don't have the best code performance because you're basically writing say JavaScript, that JavaScript gets compiled down the Android case to um, bytecode, JVM bytecode, and that JVM, the JavaScript to JVM bytecode uh, transition isn't as efficient if you, as if you had written that original code in Kotlin or Java. Um, and that just happens to be how the JVM works. And I think there's kind of some similar downsides with um, iOS, although I don't know as much of the technical behind the scene details on that front. And there's also going to be the slow adoption of new features. Um, when Android or iOS add a new feature to the Android or iOS for AP, uh, OSs, it's going to take a while for these cross-platform solutions to add in support for that. So if you do it natively, obviously that support comes right when the feature comes out because Google or Apple are the one providing the developer tooling. But when you're using a cross-platform solution, you need to wait for Google or Apple to release the native developer tooling. And then whoever's maintaining the cross-platform framework needs to then go in and add support for that in the cross-platform framework. And there's just potentially less developer tooling because um, the majority of apps are still written natively. So there's a larger development developer community building out kind of tooling and online support for native. Uh, there, I broke cross-platform types down into four types. Um, one is just kind of a bucket term that it's not a real term. I just came up with it because it's what I think of them or how I categorize them in my head. And then three ones that I think show the most promise. So this legacy bucket is all of the kind of older cross-platform solutions. And these are the ones where it can be very obvious to a user that the app isn't written natively. And this is Apache Cordova, PhoneGap, and Ionic. All of those are kind of built around the same kind of JavaScript framework. Um, and then there's Xamarin, which uses um, C Sharp. Um, and so those are what I categorize as kind of the legacy cross-platform types. You don't really see any new apps starting up using these. Um, most of the apps that are using these are older apps that are still have ongoing support. And then the, the big one that kind of brought cross-platform, I think, more mainstream and more widely accepted was React Native, which is developed by Facebook. It uses JavaScript with the React framework. And um, this one gained a lot of popularity a couple of years ago. Um, and there's still a lot of support for it, but there has been 
some companies like Airbnb that initially adopted React Native have since kind of backpedaled away from React Native and towards Native. Um, and then there's Flutter, which is developed by Google themselves, and it's written in Dart. Um, Flutter is a weird one. It, I really like it myself. I've used it a lot, not professionally, but personally. And um, it's really neat, but it does lose out on some of the big benefits that cross-platform offers in the terms of language familiarity. Um, not many people know Dart. Not many people use Dart. Um, and as a result, you kind of lose out on the benefit of like, oh, we just have these Dart developers. Let's have them build the app in Flutter because there aren't really that many Dart developers because it doesn't have a lot of use cases that have been very popular. But in terms of performance, Flutter generally offers some pretty good performance from what I've seen. And then the one that I think has the most potential is Kotlin Multi-Platform. Um, this one's developed by JetBrains, who are the makers of Kotlin, as well as the makers of IntelliJ, WebStorm, all those fun IDs. And this one is completely business logic only, um, and it can't be used to write UI. So if you're using Kotlin Multi-Platform, you still have to write your native UI. But um, I think it offers a lot of potential in the fact that the UI ends up being one of the biggest downsides of a lot of uh, cross-platform solutions. And so by not even addressing that, they can really focus on just um, being able to share the business logic and the stuff that powers the UI. And I think there's a lot of potential there, but Kotlin platform multi-platform is very new. So um, it's gonna be interesting to see if it picks up some steam. Uh, JetBrains has a yearly developer survey they send out. And um, here's the results for their question about cross-platform frameworks from both 2019 and 2020. As we see, Kotlin, I said Kotlin multi-platform is pretty new, so it didn't exist in 2019 yet. And it launched and it's already at 2% this year. We'll see if it continues to pick up steam. Uh, React Native is kind of holding a steady lead two years in a row. Um, Flutter is picking up steam. And then Cordova, Ionic, Xamarin and PhoneGap are all steadily declining. Um, if you're going to build a frame, if you're going to build an app in JavaScript, there's really no reason anymore to use kind of Cordova or PhoneGap over something like React Native. And then Unity is relatively stable, but Unity is mainly just used for gaming and physics engines. So um, it's kind of very different than all of the other cross-platform solutions. So with that said, let's take a look at Instant Apps and App Clips, which are some cool stuff that is pretty new. Um, and so the concept, the names are a bit vague, but the concept is they're essentially mini apps that can be ran without installation. Um, and they offer a limited subset of a standard apps functionality. Um, and so essentially the idea is that you pull up a website and this website corresponds with a mobile app that exists in the app store but you don't have the mobile app. So instead of taking you to the app store to download it or to the mobile, the website that may or may not be mobile friendly, it will bring you up the native UX that you would see as if you had the app installed on your phone. Um, and it's a really cool idea. Um, not much is being done with it yet. And um, that's because of, it's pretty new, um, which I'll get into in a bit. But um, I think there's a lot of potential here of kind of revolutionizing how the mobile browser works and how things work when people do or do not have apps installed. Um, and so these instant apps and app clips are meant to work really well with Apple slash Google sign-in as well as digital wallet. And these, and they're designed with good API support for that so that the user can, for example, go through an entire flow of your product without ever having to install the native app if they didn't want to. And also when you're using one of these instant apps, there is a button um, in one of the corners, I think it's placed differently on each platform that gives you the option to kind of download the full app for full functionality. So it's kind of an interesting concept. Um, instant apps are the Android version. They were announced in 2016, launched in 2017. Um, a few companies like Quora started using it pretty early on. 
but they never really picked up a lot of steam yet because there was not iOS support as well. And iOS support is AppClips, and that was announced and launched just a little bit earlier this year. And so I think now that the same kind of concept exists on both platforms, we're going to see in the coming years a lot more investment from companies into building out support for this. Uh, let's just look at kind of a brief, some brief examples of how it might use. Um, so if you open a link on your phone, if the full app's installed, it will open up the full app. If uh, the full app isn't there and that app supports mini apps or app clips and some apps, whatever you want to call it, that uh, mini app will be streamed to your device. And if they're not supporting instant apps, then it'll just fall back to what it does currently, which is open a link in the browser. And so use case might be, say, mobile parking payment. For example, I'm going to drive to LA tomorrow, for example. And I'm going to go use some public parking, but I don't drive to LA very often. And this public parking I'm using has a mobile app to pay for my parking. But I don't really want to install their app on my phone because I'm never going to go to LA again for ex in this example. So what you can do is say you scan the QR code that's on the parking side. And instead of taking you to the app store, to download the app, it will launch this instant app. In the instant app, you see the full native experience as if you had the app. You can enter your parking space number, decide how many hours of parking you want, and then launch Apple or Google Pay to process the payment. And then you're done. Um, so it's a really nice way of kind of using a really mobile friendly, clean UX experience without having the user download the app. And how it works on the devices is that these instant apps are kind of streamed. And by stream, they're kind of downloaded in quick time while you're using them to a specific section of your phone. And then um, if a certain period of time, I might be 30 days, it might, it might differ on platform to platform. But if a certain period of time goes by where that instant app isn't used again, then it's cleared from your phone storage and that kind of frees up that space. And I think there's a similar operation that will happen where it'll clear out that directory if your phone is low on storage. Um, an example Google also gives is a one level demo of a game. I've, I've never seen anything that, I've never seen any games that take advantage of this yet. So I don't know how feasible that is, but uh, a game demo is an example that Google provides in some of their official developer docs. Um, in terms of biometrics, uh, quick history, fingerprint sensors were first added with the Motorola Atrix in 2011. Uh, Touch ID came to the iPhone 5S in 2013, two years later. Iris Unlock came to the Galaxy Note 7 in 16. And then in 17, Face ID came to the iPhone X. Um, face and fingerprint are the two kind of main biometric unlock functionalities on mobile devices currently. Um, face unlock is generally faster, while fingerprint unlock is less battery intensive. Um, spinning up the cameras for the face unlock, unfortunately, is still very battery intensive at the moment. Um, there'll obviously be improvements there as time goes on. Um, so there's a trade-off there. And then the security for the, all the biometrics on mobile is still kind of up to date, um, up for debate. Um, if you ask different people, different people will tell you whether fingerprint or face unlock is more secure. In the end, I see them both as conveniences right now. Um, I don't think we're at the level of security with either of these that would ever match like a fingerprint or a retinal scan on like a non-mobile device. Um, that may come in the future, but at the moment they're kind of just more of convenience functionality. And uh, just a little peek, there's a projected growth of 15.63 billion in the next four years um, in terms of the global mobile biometrics market. So there's a lot of money going into investment and research on this front right now. Um, and this is according to market research company Technavio. Um, and so because there's a lot of research going on right now, I think there's going to be kind of a lot of changes in, say, the next 10 years in terms of the type of biometrics that come on your phone. And I think we might get closer and closer to the fact where 
security is less up to up for debate and these are more seen as the most secure options rather than just they're secure but they're more of a convenience over like a password or pin which they are now and then uh, i'm running low on time so i'm just going to quickly hit ar and vr um, so ar is augmented reality and add digital elements to the live view of the world around you and that's often done these days with a smartphone camera examples include google glass which um, failed, but I think it was kind of ahead of its time. I wouldn't be shocked if we end up seeing something similar to Google Glass come back and become more mainstream in the future. Uh, face filters and like Snapchat and Instagram, those are all examples of real world AR that's being used. And then games like Pokemon Go that was popular a few years back. And then virtual reality, on the other hand, is a completely immersive virtual experience. And while a lot of applications of AR are currently mobile focused, um, VR is not as mobile focused. Um, it has kind of three types. It has standalone uh, VR headsets, phone powered VR headsets and PC powered. Um, right now, I think a lot of the focus on VR is in the PC powered and standalone markets. Um, I do think phone powered will gain a focus as we get further in, um, right now, the focus for VR from consumer point is a lot of gaming. And for gaming, it makes sense that you'd want the more power that comes from the PC or standalone. Um, but I think once we see some more non-gaming applications of VR, we'll see kind of more phone powered. And then just here's a chart um, from Goldman Sachs of kind of predictions for what the AR VR landscape is gonna look like in 2025. Um, as we'll see, gaming still has a big lead in the consumer market with 11.6 billion um, estimated. Um, but I think we'll probably see more live events and more video entertainment and non-gaming stuff, um, especially with COVID. And I think COVID has shown the interest and probably the potential of doing virtual events. And so I think because of that, we'll see more of a VR focus in the next few years on that as well. And I do think in engineering and healthcare in particular, there's a lot of kind of interesting applications that VR has or AR that um, aren't very consumer friendly. So they don't get talked about a lot, but I could see like virtual surgery training and a lot of interesting stuff being done there. I think it's being used a lot in real estate, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's all it's currently being used a lot in real estate for like virtual walk tours and things like that. Um, so it's going to be interesting. These predictions from Goldman Sachs were, I believe, from before COVID hit. So I would be interested to see um, if now that we live in a co post COVID world, if um, Goldman Sachs would tweak their kind of predictions of what the landscape is going to look like in five years. Because um, I do think, I do think we had a lot of things that we learned about what you can and can't do virtually with uh, COVID. So it's going to yeah, be interesting. I see us along. She's using it um, to actually change decor in real estate too. So yeah. you know, go into a blank space and kind of move furniture around and things like that. So yeah. Yeah, that's really cool stuff. And I think I just have two quick, two more slides quickly. Um, so smart home devices in terms of IoT is really really took off in 2017, as we saw a jump um, in billions of dollars of sales in the US from 1.3 to 3.4. And so the steady increase there, um, I think this plays into the fact that Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, all of those kind of smart speaker devices have become very popular. I think I have like five Google speakers list sitting around because Google keeps giving it to for me for free because they want they want to hear my conversations or something, but um, I think there's stuff here is really picked up in the smart home technology, and that's kind of where IoT has been trending currently. Um, but I will be interested to see kind of in the coming years. I think there's a lot of IoT potential that lives outside of the smart home ecosystem, and I'll be curious to see if we see more of that. Um, just things like NFC. Um, kind of check-ins and stuff, NFC tickets and stuff to get into events are already kind of flirting with the IoT 
space. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, clearly, in the home, it's a popular niche right now. And then wearable shipments, this is the final chart I have. Um, Apple has had the commanding lead I, since they've launched the Apple Watch, essentially. Um, Wear OS has never really picked up on the Android side. Um, I'm an Android developer. I've run an Android meetup. I don't even own a Wear OS watch. This is a Fitbit. <laughs> like, I, uh, I've never seen a reason to use Wear OS because Google's never invested in it. Um, and I, I, think, I think eventually Google's going to be forced to invest more into the wearable space. Um, and I think we saw this a bit last year when they initially purchased Fitbit, or I don't know if the purchase is cleared yet, but um, they announced their intention to purchase Fitbit at least, which is probably a sign that they realized that they need to do something to kind of catch up to Apple in the uh, wearable space. But um, so far, we're just not there. And it also did, um, there was, the peak was in Q4 for 2018. I'm not sure why though. I don't know if some new Apple Watch came out then or something, but just kind of interesting to see um, where the shipments lie. Quick recap, uh, iOS still on top in the US, Android is king globally. It's hard to make money from the app store outside of games, which is why what I said is most popular apps are merely a mechanism for getting a product to a user base rather than the app being the product themselves. Um, I'd look for instant app and app clips to kind of simplify the mobile web experience in the coming years. Uh, native apps still dominate the marketplace, but I think cross-platform is catching up fast. Um, so if I was a developer trying to get into the space, I would make sure I know, make sure I have a good understanding of at least one of the native frameworks, but also kind of have an eye forward at some of the more popular cross-platform solutions. And then uh, biometrics, wearables continue to um, kind of change how we, we and our phones interface with the world. Um, we've seen like mobile payments that have picked up pace in the recent years. And I think we're going to see more kind of similar things that kind of change how we use our phone to do everyday things. And then AR and VR is really hard to predict. It's um, a very vast kind of ecosystem, but I think there's the most potential for kind of revolutionary changes. I know I went through all that kind of fast. Um, hopefully I didn't go too fast. Um, any questions? What are your thoughts about 5G? Um, <laughs> it's an interesting question. Um, I think 5G is going to be really cool when it's here. I don't think what most of the current US like cell phone companies are advertising as 5G is like the true 5G. I think much like um, much like what happened when 4G first came out, uh, the companies are kind of using it as a marketing term. I know when 4G became popular, um, for example, I think it was T-Mobile, T-Mobile or Sprint, I forget which one, they were doing like, they were labeling something as 4G that wasn't like what Verizon and AT&T were doing for 4G. Um, and I think we're in that phase right now with 5G. Um, but I think it's going to be really cool. You, We've already seen like the trend where a lot of people have gotten rid of their like home phone lines and just using their cell phone. Um, if 5G can truly kind of achieve some of the speeds that it promises, then I'll be interested to see if we see a similar trend of people getting rid of home internet and just purely going more towards using their phone as a hotspot. I have a question for you. Uh, what, how, what do you see going forward with wearables and medical? Like, uh, you know, right now, like I use a smartwatch um, I actually use Samsung Health um, quite a bit more just because it's integrated with the phone already. Uh, but, you know, it's nice to like when I'm yelling at my kids or I'm stressed out, it's definitely <laughs> nice to see a Fitbit and kind of see where my 
blood, you know, my heart rate is and things like that. Um, but where do you see it kind of going forward as preventative care or as an alert system? Uh, you know, I think there's some of it that's already going on right now. Yeah, no, I definitely think some of the most interesting stuff is going to come in the medical space in terms of wearables. Like, honestly, like the heart rate monitoring and stuff is the only reason I even have a Fitbit. Like, I just thought like, oh, that's, it's on sale. I, that seems like it might be useful to have. Um, I think... I think it's still a little bit of ways away, but I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, like I'm thinking back um, in right now, like in the medical space, they have, um, I don't know, I don't know what it's called, so forgive me, but it's this thing they'll put on your chest and then you kind of wear it for, I think it was like three days and it captures like data on your heart rhythm and like looking for irregular heartbeats and stuff like that and you wear it for three days and then you take it off and then you put it in the package and you like send it to whatever address where they process it and like pull the data off of the device. Um, I think in five to 10 years, I wouldn't be shocked if they had, if something like that was replaced with something that kind of syncs with your phone so that it could send real time data to your doctor instead of you know, capturing data for three days and then having to be sent off in the mail somewhere for processing. Um, so I think there's potential companies that are doing it uh, or, and also obviously there's some security issues I'm sure with it. And yeah, the, there's obviously going to be a lot of security stuff you have to figure out when with a lot of the medical stuff, um, like we're seeing a lot of companies with the higher end smart watches, they add the, uh, EKG or ECG. I forget which one it is, but the it's specific, um, kind of heart rate tracking. That's more more advanced than like the standard one that comes on phones. And that has to be um, cleared by the FDA or one of the federal agents has to like approve for them to turn it on. And we've seen a lot of devices that ship and it's like, it's gonna have this feature pending federal approval. So there's a lot of hurdles that these companies so far have been struggling to jump through. But I do really think that we're gonna see kind of in the coming years, a lot of the kinks worked out and a lot of the um, stuff become a lot easier for the kind of wearable manufacturers to do. And even beyond like the consumer, like the normal like smartwatches, um, I know some people that like when they run, they wear a, um, a stress, a uh, chest like heart rate monitor that's supposed to be more accurate than, um, you know, the standard phone. And I wouldn't be shocked if we see kind of more wearables that you know you have more items than just say a watch that you know somehow connects with your phone um i don't you know i wouldn't be like i, I said earlier that i think google glass was ahead of its time in a sense that um i wouldn't be shocked if in 10 years we have a similar thing where if you're wearing glasses you can get like smart glasses that sync with your phone and stuff um and so that's obviously not like in the medical space, but that's where, I, you know, we might see some new stuff in wearables where it's, you know, beyond just watches, which it currently exists as. Well, hopefully one day it can go to like that, that show from the 80s or 90s uh, kit with that, you know, where you can <laughs> run your car from your phone. That, that yeah. seems like it's, um, you know, something we'll see in our lifetime. I know with Tesla, you can do that with the phone app, but not with the watch yet right so. yeah when so. we see we see with iot there's so much you can control with your phone like i i have the nest app on my phone so i could turn on or off my you know air conditioner from my desk and not walk you know downstairs to go turn on my ac and so we see them like the smart home space and so i wouldn't be surprised to see some of that stuff you know expand beyond that obviously yeah, I know you can preheat an oven now too, um, mobily, so that's... I just think back to, so my uncle's in New York, and uh, he lives in New York City, and growing up, like, in the winter, he'd have to go run outside, start the car, <laughs> and then run back inside, and like, you know, bundle up while he waited for, like, the engine to heat up so that the yeah. car could actually move in the winter, but... You know, now if he got the right now if he got the right car, he could probably all do that from his phone. <laughs> yeah. 
That's true. Uh, there's another question about, do you see growth from other Linux-based mobile OSs? Unfortunately not. I, I think we're at the point where it's going to be very hard for anyone to break through um, and kind of disrupt the kind of two kind of two company uh, market share of, you know, Apple and Google in terms of iOS and Android. Um, you know, Windows, Microsoft obviously tried with Windows Phone and that never took off. And Microsoft has a lot of resources behind them. Um, and so if they wanted to buy their way into the market share, they probably could have found ways to do that. But the fact that they didn't tells me that they deemed that it wasn't going to be financially viable in the long term. Um, and I just, you know, I think there can, there's probably going to end up being niches in the Linux community, but I just don't see that anything is going to pick up mainstream in the sense that it'll get above, say, 8 to 10% market share. I think it's, you know, Android and iOS have been the two, the two lone people at the top for so long that it's going to be really hard to kind of justify users to join a new ecosystem. I know in, at least in the phone space, like in wearables, it's a lot more, there's a lot more custom OSs in the wearable space, like Fitbit runs its own OS um, and a lot of other kind of manufacturers that make normal watches, but also smart watches. They also have their own like custom OSs, but uh, it's gonna be really hard in a pure phone space. Uh, sorry, <laughs> just me. Um, I wanted to just touch back on, um, are you aware of, about COVID tracking and mobile apps? Um, I thought there were some countries that are doing some things with it and what's going to happen. Um, I saw, I believe, a Dateline special last night um, where if these vaccines get approved in the next couple of weeks, they may be out, but they're multi-dose. And so you know, they're going to be kind of pushing notifications to remind people, um, and then how will they be tracking, you know, outside of kind of paper systems. Um, I don't know if you're aware of what's going on, and I guess maybe kind of ties back into the medical aspect of where, where you see. <laughs> so I, know, I know some companies are using uh, mobile to do kind of contact tracing. Um, I don't believe the U.S. is one of those countries. I don't believe we're doing wide-scale contact tracing in general. Um, but all of that stuff obviously is going to differ from country to country because different countries have different regulations. And my understanding is to do contact tracing, you'll need to be kind of tracing people's locations. And, you know, that may, the legality of that from a legal standpoint probably differs from country to country of, you know, how much control they have over kind of tracking people's locations that don't opt into it. Um, obviously, I think, there's a lot of potential there um, to do that. Obviously, I think we're kind of beyond that point in the sense that I think anything that's gonna like radically change in the terms of how we use our phone for like COVID tracking is probably not going to be come out until like after COVID is less of a problem at this point. Yeah. Um, but I think there's obviously a lot of potential learnings that, you know, the community at large can do in the sense of like, how do we have better preparedness for something like this in the future and use phones to our advantage? Um, Maybe that'll be a interesting lunch and learn topic for the future for next year of just in general, how mobile and tech, uh, sorry, medical and tech kind of work together. I know there's a lot of changes happening. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it'd be interesting, right? Like if you're in an accident, if they, they can know what your blood type is and things like that, like a medical card, but not a card <laughs> or, you know, so, but obviously security issues. Uh, Leonard has a question. Can you read it, uh, Ken, or do you want me to? Uh, yeah, I can, I can read it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, first off, uh, Ken, great job. Thank you for the presentation. Um, 
I wanted to know um, since you're doing the developments in mobile apps do you see a lot of demands from businesses uh, this is like a market kind of a question um, you mentioned that the app mostly these days are not just the app itself but uh, for for as a mean to provide services do you have a lot of demands developing mobile apps yeah I think there's um, there's a lot of demand I think for companies like to have mobile apps built for them um I think like I kind of alluded to um most of the demand right now exists in kind of companies that exist outside of just the mobile space. Um, and I think that's intentionally because like I showed with some of the charts, it's really hard to make a mobile app purely product that makes money. Um, but there's a lot of companies that are always kind of looking for mobile, um, you know, because there's always gonna be constant updates that have to be made. Um, you know, we're not, most companies aren't going to have the mobile app built once and then throw it over the fence and never touch it again. Um, you know, there's constant improvements being made. And then as new API features come out, there's new functionality that kind of mobile apps need to, you know, expand to utilize as well as update to support. Um, so from what I've seen, there is fairly decent demand. Um, most of the demand still seems to be in the native space. Um, but I could see, I do see that changing in say the next five years, I can definitely see um, more of a demand for um, non-mobile or not, I'm sorry, non-native. And on those uh, uh, apps that you develop do they mostly demand iOS platform or is it Android? So that uh, that one, a lot of it depends on kind of the target base. Um, hmm. So if a company is purely in companies that mainly target the US, they still tend to. Um, well, let me backtrack a little. So most most major companies that are already established they're going to support both platforms regardless. Mm. But with that said, the ones that focus mainly on the US market share, mm. they have a kind of built in bias towards iOS in the sense of um, they think of a lot of their stuff with iOS in mind. And then Android comes in and kind of does the Android version of whatever they came up with for iOS. I see. But if you're targeting, say, a global comp say you're targeting india if you're targeting india then you would be um you would be insane if i <laughs> to uh not target android first because of how big the kind of market share is for android over ios sure um, like in i i showed the global chart earlier i think in india it's even less for ios like I think iOS is maybe down to like 10% in India. Sure. Um, so there's always those things that get considered, but in the US specifically, there is a kind of built-in bias for a lot of companies towards iOS. And um, I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. Sometimes it's a product reason of, you know, most of our users are on iOS. Other times it's more of a reason of like, Oh, well, most of our designers have an iPhone. So our designers think of iOS designs instead mm. of Android designs. Um, so there's a lot of kind of factors at play in a lot of that stuff. But mm. um, usually you'd only target one, only one of the two platforms. Mm. If like you're a kind of completely new company and like this is your kind of POC to see like if your mobile app can pick up Steam. Mm. Mm. One more quick question, if I am allowed. <laughs> yep. uh, on the development of, of the mobile app, what is the the cost these days in the market? Uh, I know this is so difficult to answer because uh, um, each app, depending on the functionalities and, and challenges, that uh, the price is obviously different. 
uh, for something like a version control, like a project management, uh, um, handling a team, uh, some, somewhat like that. Uh, what would what would be the cost if, uh, say, for example, if I'm asking you, say, hey, your company is doing mobile app development. Uh, I have something like this in mind. I have a specific functions that uh, per for our, our own business. What would be the cost on average, roughly? Mm. I unfortunately not sure if I have a good answer for that. Um, <laughs> you know, there's so many factors at play. Um, you know, there's a difference. Sorry, so I'm not in consulting anymore, but I spent five years in consulting previously. And there's so many factors at play and stuff like this. There's like, are you billing by the hour? Are you, uh, you know, working on like a fixed bid project? Um, the in general, it's a lot of money. <laughs> but I would give that answer for any kind of kind of software development. Like if you ask me, you know, I don't want to use Squarespace or like any of the pre-built things. How do I build that? How much is it going to cost to build a fully custom website? It's going to be a lot of money. <laughs> like, sure. um, yeah, unfortunately, I I don't have a good number just to throw out because there's there's just too many unknowns and too many factors. I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. Any other questions? Like that's it for questions. If anyone has a last couple questions. Please go ahead and post them or turn on your mics and ask. Otherwise, I just wanted to say again, happy holidays to everybody. Thank you for the regulars who have attended all our lunch and learns this year. Uh, it's been a very interesting year for us to start as the ICS alumni chapter this year. We had some interesting uh, in-person events that we had planned and COVID hit, so we had to go fully virtual, but it has been a very great learning experience and it actually got us to do these lunch and learn series and have different speakers with different topics. So I think all in all, it's actually really fun and learning, uh, fun and learning and a great way to network with people that necessarily aren't local to Irvine and can't come to in-person events. So, you know, COVID or not, I think we are looking forward to doing virtual events as part of our portfolio going forward. Looking forward, again, you know, we're trying to do some social events uh, virtually as such as game night and a tech scavenger hunt. Uh, look out for our January lunch and learn event about innovation and being the new you in the new year. Black History Month and Women's History Month for the first quarter and we'll have some other exciting events in the future quarters ahead. Visit us on our website, www.icsanteaters.org, and there you will find links to connect with us on social media platforms. Again, happy holidays. Ken, this was very insightful. Uh, a lot of people joined, you know, considering it's a holiday month. Um, any tips and tips, tricks on what to buy uh, if you're looking for mobile phones or wearables? <laughs> um, it's a hard one. Uh... If you want a wearable and you have an iPhone, get an Apple Watch. Um, if you have an Android, then it's really the Wild West. There's no like clear leader on the non-Apple side in terms of wearables. And uh, phones, just, I don't know, try to, try to get something that looks like a good deal. Read reviews online um, and kind of decide what's important for you. Like some phones focus on cameras, other focus on, you know, speed, um, battery life. It really depends on what you're looking for. Um, it does look like Joshua had one more question, I think. Uh, yes, I did. Thanks, uh, Ken. So um, I'm curious to hear more about your experience and challenges with um, testing and maintaining these systems. So like if you have something like React Native and you talked about issues where, for instance, you have like layouts that um, don't necessarily match across the different platforms, I'm wondering um, have, to what extent you've automated, how, to what extent, how do you deal with regressions? Uh, what are some of the major challenges you face as a, as a mobile developer? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, so there's, a lot of it depends on if you're like working on a project by yourself or if you're part of like a company that has a full team. Um, 
for example, I'll use my company Acorns, for example, we have like a full QA team and we do, we do weekly releases that go out every Monday and those are cut like the week prior. And through that week prior, that whole release candidate basically goes through internal QA testing. Um, it gets uploaded to an alpha channel so that any of people internal to the company can download the kind of alpha build on their phone. Um, so there's a lot of like kind of manual processes like that, where you do kind of QA testing like that. Um, you could do some UI testing to cover some of the regression stuff. Um, I don't know too much about the UI testing tools on iOS, but unfortunately on Android, the uh, Espresso UI testing framework isn't very great. Um, it's slow and has a, has a habit of hanging if you're trying to run it on say like a continuous integration, continuous delivery system like Circle CI or Jenkins. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of it kind of has to rely on manual testing from my experience. Although you could try things like Firebase uh, device labs. And with something like that, you can kind of upload a version of your app and then test it simultaneously on kind of multiple virtual devices that are in the kind of Google Firebase cloud. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question at all. Uh, no, that's that's helpful. So I, I'm wondering, so to what extent do you automate your test and you know, from your experience like any point? So in my experience, I usually focus on automating um, the kind of the unit tests, the ones that kind of focus on the non-UI business logic, um, because that's a lot easier to automate. Um, the one place where you can automate some UI tests is if you set up some snapshot testing. And so what snapshot testing is, will do is, um, you know, when you're developing, say, a new screen, you take a picture of that screen, you add it to um, version control along with the code, and then you can run the snapshot test, which will spin up that same screen on a virtual device, take a screenshot, and then see if that screenshot matches what was taken during development. Um, obviously, this assumes that whatever was taken during development is correct, um, which may or may not be the case, because like there can be regressions in the sense of we broke what we intended, or there can also be like UI issues in the sense of the developers didn't implement the design that design wanted. Um, and so it's hard to automate cases like that. Um, gotcha. All right. Thanks, Ken. Yep. Perfect. Joshua, you look at, like you're on vacation. <laughs> Your background. <laughs> so this is actually. Um, an errant BNB Zoom background from New Zealand, a place <laughs> where there, there's not that much COVID. <laughs> nice. I uh, wish you could probably be there in person, right? <laughs> That's that would not be too bad. Yeah, compared to like wildfire smells and stuff around here. <laughs> that definitely sounds like it would be better. For Irvine. Uh yes yes I am um I'm I'm an assistant professor here. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, I, I saw that very first. Okay, cool. Um, it, are there any other questions? Otherwise, again, Ken, thank you so much. We're very informative. We're right at the one hour, um, but we're on track. You, you, you had a great presentation on time. So appreciate it. Happy holidays, everyone. See you guys in 2021. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll be available on social uh, for the next couple of weeks still. So feel free to reach out and connect there. And See you next year with some brand new programming. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank Happy you. Holiday. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Pooja. Bye.